So you want me to ask, what is E2D first? Yep. Setting up your meeting for YouTube, done redirecting. Do you oh, want me to ask that E2D first? Yeah. first. Yep. Um, oh, I think we're living. live. We're live. Yes. Um, hey, Shelby, how are you? Hi, Barry. Nice to nice to see you. I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. Just what I've discovered about your program in the past few weeks. And I think it's exciting to let more people know about it because it has tremendous potential. And I know that you're excited to grow it. So I'm excited to ask you a few questions. Thank you. Um, for those who doesn't know what A2D World School is, we are A2D World School. And we believe we are the first of its kind. Uh, and we have um, Shelby Long Hammond here with us. She's an education entrepreneur from Montana. And I myself is a, <laughs> what do you think I am Shelby? Now that you know me a little bit. <laughs> also an educational entrepreneur, but I think an educational entrepreneur that is more of your philosophy, which I think is great because you want people to think about how to use their skills in a real, in a career setting. And I think that's amazing. So cool. you um, are an entrepreneur and you are, <laughs> we are, we are both in the educational entrepreneur space. Exactly. Thank you, Shelby, for that mini introduction of myself as well. Um, um, uh, as we exchange of ideas, um, I, I just want to um, uh, reflect on our educational philosophy. Um, um, I think you and I kind of connected and talked about this. Um, E2D World School truly genuinely believe lifelong learning is the way to go. Um, this really struck me in 2008 when um, a MIT graduate was holding a sign that MIT graduate for hire after the stock market crash. It really bothered me uh, with a million dollar education, a person walking around in Wall Street lost. And I truly genuinely believe that um, our today's education system somehow has something missing somewhere where the rubbers are not meeting the roads. Uh, that's part of the reason I started A2D World School because I personally also have those um, um, uh, personal connections to the similar incidents in my personal family life, on in my personal life in personal level and the community that I'm involved with. I've seen so many of us have been similar situation where um, um, we're just kind of lost in the career because we have been shown a cookie cutter way that's supposed to work. And all of a sudden we find in ever changing world, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, what's your thought on that, Shelby? I, I, I feel I am in higher education. I'm a professor at a college and I do, I do feel that as well. I feel that there's some disconnect between what you learn and how you apply it uh, that doesn't mean that the education is not good. It just means that there's, it, it also your students have changed and your audience has changed and, and the world has changed. I think technology has accelerated, accelerated processes that it's really challenging to keep up with. And I think there's, there's lots of things that are further separating the business world from the education world. And creating more of those connections, I think, is, is a really important foundation, which is why I'm inspired by, the, by what you do within the school. Um, it, so your philosophy is to make more of those connections. Talk, talk about how that happens with students in E2D. Thank you, Shelby. That's a wonderful question. Um, at E2D, we, we decided that, um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the idea of road, emergency roadside assistant. Um, but sure. we are familiar with <laughs> I'm in Montana, so I hate that. <laughs> and it's zero <laughs> negative degrees outside, so of course, yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah, when the flat tire happens, uh, AAA are blessings. That's what kind of dawned on me one day is like, our in education uh, journey or learning journey in our life, uh, uh, flat tires happen in our life all the time. Um, um, what if there was a company that came and rescued you when that happened? 
And that could be in any part of our life, lifelong journey. And because it's, um, um, it's an education where um, you can reopen yourself. Our primary audience that we look for is actually um, uh, high school and above. And it could be a high schooler, it could be a university student, or it could be an entrepreneur like you. We're looking to connect with these lifelong learners where it could just be one of your tools to solve some puzzles. What do you want to do next with your life? I really don't want anybody from anywhere in the world with higher quality um, academic degrees to feel that they have not been empowered to run their own life, uh, which I think is a quote straight from um, um, one of the Fortune 500s. I believe it's Jeff Bezos who said, you are the CEO of your own life, or maybe it's so much somebody else said that, uh, but that is a fact. If we maintain a journey towards our uh, dream job, two hours a week, um, our, our retirement, extra two hours of work, something that we have passion about, if whether we're in a passionate job today or not, uh, someday we might be able to get to our passionate job with those two hours, which accumulates and which happened to my life. Um, in my early career, I was used to be a software engineer and uh, I wanted to retire early and I committed to myself that every week I'm going to spend at least two hours for my future career because I've seen my father, my grandpa, uh, after they retired, they had no idea what they're going to do. And I felt that's just so wrong. Uh, so I wanted to retire at um, my 40s in my early 20s <laughs> so that I could do whatever I want. And I, I'm at 46 right now. I would like to claim that I'm partially retired, which I hope and pray that I never fully retire. But um, um, whatever I do, I should never want to feel that I'm actually in a work. I do something that, that I do from my heart, which is running my education businesses. Um, so yeah. so. Um, we find students and likely-minded folks. We connect, we build relationship, and then we provide them with our partner um, um, academic portion of it, or we help them choose their best possible academic options. And then E2D facilitates the experiential part of what that's supposed to look like, which means it ha we have four tools or legs. Uh, one is, um, whatever academic background you have, can you apply that inside E2D or within E2D partner um, network? Uh, number two is, can you apply that in a civic engagement context so that you build your network? Number three is, can you do it in a way so that you actually can reach a global audience? Um, um, so as you reach a global audience, um, um, whether it's an internship, externship, or work study in a global context, um, um, the final thing we'd like to see that you use your learning experience as an um, education entrepreneur to share with others. This is the journey of any E2D member, whether you are a college, high school, or university, or you're an education entrepreneur. I hope someday what are, uh, but your coaching business goes to the height where E2D has an impact on it uh, to grow. Uh, and as you can see, you're my coach right now. So hopefully that itself um, uh, gave you some clients and this interview brings you more clients because I'm in a community of a global network of educators who are uh, co-sponsored or co-accredited by um, University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education and Wharton. Um, uh, and that's my academic background, by the way. I, I have a doctoral um, uh, level education from University of Pennsylvania Chief Learning Officers Network. Um, be before that, I was a um, uh, bachelor's degree holder and a master's degree holder from uh, Minnesota State College uh, called Metropolitan State and Mi Minnesota Public uh, Private School called University of St. Thomas. That's my alma mater. <laughs> How about you? Tell me a little, bit, a little about yourself. My education? Yeah. Yeah, um, I I grew up in Idaho, and then um, I've, I've done all my schooling in Montana. So I went to Carroll College, small, private Catholic school for my undergrad, and I studied secondary education actually, with, and social studies. I wanted to, to teach high school, and then I also, in that experience, I competed on uh, the college debate team. And in my competition with the college debate team, I wanted to continue work in collegiate debate after I finished. So 
after I finished my degree, I had the opportunity, tremendous opportunity to go to Lewis and Clark College out in Portland, Oregon. And I helped run their debate program or their was part of their debate program for three years. And that inspired me to get my master's degree and in communication studies. And I wanted to continue the work in the college. So that brought me to the University of Montana to do my school. And so I did my master's degree there in communication studies, great program, still ran the debate program there. And then uh, when I was finished, I, that is when the job in Billings, Montana at Rocky Mountain College came open and that's, I've been here ever since. So I've been directing the debate team, also teach in organizational communication, business communication. And then more recently in the past two years, I have started this business branding and um, business coaching, uh, this educational entrepreneurship using my foundations in communication to be the foundation for my business. So that's my background. It's uh, that I am really curious about this global education. I'm gonna ask you about that in a minute, but uh, I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world. Maybe not as much as I want to, but I've, I've had the opportunity to travel over the world and teach debate and use debate as a vehicle to practice argumentation, practice communication. And so I'm really attracted to that global background of your of the E2D World School. I, I believe that provides a tremendous experience for students to have that multicultural experience. Can you talk about the importance of the global backdrop in uh, your education? Or Thank in, you, um... in your philosophy? <laughs> of course. Um, so something, um... It's it's what a wonderful question again. Um, I, I we learned about resonant leadership uh, by Goldman, uh, Daniel Goldman, um, and some of his teammates. And uh, at UPenn, uh, my uh, faculties were actually from that discipline. Uh, emotional intelligence, connecting with the world, with communication, soft skills. Uh, so your debate, um, um, which is actually a healthy debate, not Capitol Hill fight debate is actually the point is so empowering. Um, um, I, um, uh, I, I debated myself. Um, uh, I, I, I'm in the United States, one of the uh, uh, assumably, presumably and uh, uh, economical and um, weapons power wise, we're number one in the world right now. Um, but when I think in, in terms of um, American leadership for education equity, I uh, reflect back my on my upbringing um, in uh, Bangladesh. I, I grew up in Bangladesh until I was 18. And then I migrated to United States in my first year in college, um, undergrad college. And when I came here, I found philosophically um, um, some of the things very questionable and challenging. I'll give you an example. Um, even though I came to United States in 1994, um, I was I, I had I brought in quite a bit of mathematical capability and reasonable English in New York City. And then when I was uh, interviewing for for a school job to just do a tutoring, um, uh, I could not get that. That's because um, uh, the economic economic opportunities are so limited. Um, uh, that I had to fight with a um, uh, American born, similar background person. Um, um, and I heard um, one of my friends who were actually in Minnesota was able to do the exact same thing, and, but I could not. So right. I felt, um, um, and then um, uh, I, I could not work off campus either. Um, so if I could not do it on campus, can I do off campus? I could not do that either. But my Canadian friend told me, that who was doing the same thing in Canada, they could work off campus. My Australian friend told me they could work off campus. My UK friend told me the same thing. I was like, what's going on? Am I in the wrong place to study? <laughs> and New York City apparently was not the right most place for me to study. And which I realized and eventually migrated from New York to Minnesota, which made my life so much more easier um, as a foreign student, uh, which I thank Minnesota for welcoming me as a 
cross-cultural scholarship, 50% uh, tuition down, um, um, and getting all those opportunities that I could not get in Minnesota, uh, New York to get it in Minnesota. So, so opposite of what you would think initially. So anyway. <laughs> So um, uh, um, yeah, so that, so that, so that that tells me that education equity is not equal, not only in United States, but also across the world, uh, in some sense or other. Um, and then um, another part to the education equity is the fiscal part of it. So um, I could not afford New York City tuition after my first two years degree. So I had to figure out a way to get the tuition, which I was able to afford in Minnesota, so which I migrated. But for any American student who was studying side by side, they never had to think about um, um, affording tuition because they could just get the US government loan. And even though I proved myself to be a good student, I could not apply for the same loan. Right. Um, similar case happened to my uh, adopted daughter, Larissa. Um, she came from Brazil into a um, Brazilian government scholarship, and she had to go back to Brazil because she could not afford to study in USA. So at that time, I told her, hey, um, here's the TOEFL money. If you, um, uh, 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 if you can f get your TOEFL done and get admitted to an American college, I will fund you like an American government, and you can pay me back um, uh, through your work later when you get your jobs and things like that. And four years later, through e the World School, she has finished her bachelor's degree. She's paying it forward to other students inside E2D. Um, um, and um, that process worked. So I truly believe, genuinely believe, there needs to be a process where world's underprivileged ones, uh, not the, um, the ones who genuinely would appreciate these opportunities of fiscal freedom while studying and growing themselves as the world's most productive citizens should be funded by any government, just not um, US government. Um, and I truly hope um, ETD World School is actually truly competing against those organizations who are just focusing on their own citizens, not the citizens of the world. At the end of the day, I truly believe we are the citizen of the world. I have genuinely become and um, education um, um, entrepreneur who'd like to bring in um, education equity to the world through fiscal sponsorship and providing their first dream job, not the job where um, uh, even though you have the qualification to be a tutor, you still have to do dishing on, on campus. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's, where, um, um, that's where I truly believe um, 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 A2D World School can make a difference with its partners. Why don't you, I, I'm curious more, we haven't talked about um, the founders. So you and your wife, can you, can you talk a little bit, you've talked about kind of why you founded it. Just tell me a little bit more about that story. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, um, um, uh, A2D World School currently is being co-founded by my wife and myself. Uh, my wife is actually amazing super scientist. Uh, uh, she can just solve any math problems of the world. Um, she grew up in Bangladesh, um, uh, finished her bachelor's from Bangladesh's MIT equivalent, uh, something called BUET. That's what we call that. Um, um, she had to compete against thousands of students to get in the first 20 spot or first 30 spots into electrical engineering. Uh, after finishing, she became a lecturer there, and then she came to University of Manitoba for her master's in bioelectrical, and she finished her uh, computer engineering uh, from Wayne State University, uh, PhD, and then now she works at a, um, uh, uh, besides being a sponsor, co-founder of this organization, where she mostly volunteers and uh, sponsors. She works at an um, uh, American um, medical university called Mayo Clinic. Uh, which is um, uh, next to Harvard and John Hopkins Mayo Clinic is um, uh, renounced for American uh, medical research and development. That's where she works as a data scientist right now. Um, that's her. And the other part is me, as I mentioned. Um, um, I uh, originally am from Bangladesh when I went for high school, came here to do my undergrad in computer engineering, first in New York City, then finished my second degree at Minnesota. 
and then my uh, masters were in public policy, international development, and educational leadership from University of Saint Thomas. Uh, my two undergrad degrees, one from um, City, University, uh, City Colleges in New York, and the other one is from Minnesota State University. And um, I have uh, been very privileged to get accepted into the um, uh, E2D, I'm sorry, um, University of Pennsylvania Chief Learning Officers Network um, uh, um, uh, education um, doctorate degree program. And that's where I've been doing my doctoral research um, um, and still do it. So that's me um, in a nutshell. And then uh, I think that's our academic background. Was there anything else to, in a separate part of the question? No, I just wanted to know about, wanted you to talk about the founders and kind of the story behind that. Yeah. So, you, you um, talked about some of the other things before about the, your education background and your engineering. You've talked about some of that. So I okay. just wanted to talk about the founders and how, I don't know. I think the curious question is, how did you all come up with the idea to do this? Was it so, just a light that went on? And no, I, um, uh, I, I, my wife is never an entrepreneur. <laughs> she just supports whatever passion I have. Um, and my passions happen to be around education. I, I realized that early on um, in my um, uh, technology career, I was always gravitated towards education, user groups, conferences, and it just always naturally picked me. And then my first education venture was inside an organization called HCR. It's a healthcare company. Uh, they had this challenge of when um, online university was just like a concept, HCR had this challenge of educating 64,000 of its healthcare employees to have state and government compliances across the nation. So we came up with the first uh, early version of um, HCR Manor Care Online University internally, which is in these days in a larger corporation, internal university is very common for um, folks to receive uh, professional education. Um, so at that time, it was very challenging uh, selecting a vendor, coming up with the uh, interfaces and selecting courses and making it available and mandatory for all the folks and creating digital certificates to comp uh, do compliances and things like that. So uh, these days and age, people call it uh, digital certificates, MOOCs, um, um, and then uh, Moodle with learning management systems. At that time, it was just a brand new concept as uh, early 2000 internet was just um, emerging. Uh, so that was my first major experience of launching online education um, um, within an organization. And then later on, I got involved with um, a Microsoft data platform called SQL Pass, where I was given an award for um, one of the most innovative um, um, solutions. Um, and then uh, I was the first one who started um, a Midwest SQL Server user group uh, online. And they were kind of surprised from the Midwest, there is an online uh, Midwest SQL Server user group. And since then, there has been like 30, 40 um, online user groups across the nation and across the world actually for SQL Server and uh, Microsoft Data Management Learning. Um, I co-founded several of those groups, one in Bangladesh, one in Minnesota. Some of them are really thriving learning uh, communities. I also work with um, uh, Minnesota State's um, uh, 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 state school system to come up with a continuing education um, uh, um, uh, data management program for a year, um, uh, uh, year long certificate. Those are my early career things I was doing on the yeah. side for fun. And then because I just enjoyed it, I always felt the call for it. But I think what really struck the chord was when my first son was born. Um, uh, when Aver was born, I realized that I really want to build a school for him. <laughs> So um, I actually called up one of my friends named Jerry and uh, uh, told him like, hey, I want to build a school. He, he's in the craft business where he can actually make uh, monuments and things like that with using civil engineering designs. I was like, can you make something uh, that looks like this? And I actually self-drawn it and designed it. And I, it's still in one of my walls, uh, one of my office's walls. Um, so that school that I want to build for Aver translated out to be later on as um, a charter school, multiple charter school, and then finally a charter school where Aver went to. Um, um, 
and then I'm still involved in school communities. I've done lobbying for school, uh, charter schools, as well as for, for public schools. Um, and then uh, right now, I, I'm trying to do something global in nature besides the, just the Minnesota. I'm talking to a um, uh, uh, lobbyist firm in uh, DC to see if I could influence federal, um, 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 one of the federal laws that impacts minority education um, uh, in global um, uh, context. And uh, um, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's how education started for me because my son was born and I wanted to build a, a good enough middle school for him where he would be actually taken care of. And, I, and, and that thing actually took me to other route as well. So I, I started investing on smaller education ventures like uh, Mathnasium. Mathnasium is one of our portfolio. Uh, well, Mathnasium learning ventures are global. Uh, when they, uh, people used to never know about Mathnasium and when I started it, it's around 2010, um, they would say, what is Mathnasium? <laughs> now people know that it's actually math learning center, math after school tutoring center operates like a private school. Um, and we have global location in 13 countries, about a thousand location, about a thousand entrepreneurs like you and me owns Mathnasiums. Um, it's, it gives us a wonderful network of uh, education entrepreneurs who are either half retired, semi retired or fully retired um, yeah. or just fully engaged with something they, they like doing for their community. Uh, those things emerge one thing after another. And, and now I'm in, uh, and I, in the meantime, I got introduced to a friend of mine who actually Owns, a, owns the third largest private university in Bangladesh. And uh, he wants to uh, um, enter into US market to launch an university. So we had so many things in common that, okay, I can help you with that. So that kind of got me involved in um, uh, launching a possible online university coming up um, um, in, a, in a more stronger way. Right now, technically the world school is a university, but uh, it's not accredited. Uh, but we have accreditation partners who has accreditation. So um, our goal is not necessarily to give the academic part. Our goal is to expand on the corporate experience part while maintaining the academics. So we can sponsor uh, any of our mem student members to study in uh, University of the People or study in um, any online university, uh, 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 Harvard Business School or Harvard Extension School or edX, anything that they find they qualify for, will actually fund that process as well. We'll coach them how to get into that. But while they're starting a marketing, digital marketing, our objective is to get them interested in using that knowledge to spread the education and yep. launching something with E2D. Like you like, I would love to see that you have a debate academy, global debate academy through E2D and we'd be happy to co-sponsor that. Um, uh, hopefully we can grow each other. <laughs> yeah, be interesting. I think there's a, I think there's a missing, I think it's missing now. So, I mean, the restrictions of the, in the pandemic has kind of forced everything inward. So, mm -hmm. so, but there are possibilities still out there for sure. Of course. Yeah, uh, the other questions I have, uh, if I am a parent, and I want to, and I'm, I'm weighing some education options for my child. Uh, why, what is the experience at E2D school versus other schools? And why, what's your differentiators? Um, so I, I want to answer it in um, um, two different way. In E2D, there's two part to it, I would say. Um, one is the... Um, um, section where we do deal with adult education. The other is the section that we deal with um, um, uh, K-12 education for younger kids. So um, um, I think, uh, uh, please remind me to come back to the adult part of it right now, I'm, because it, these are two independent answers. The first one I'll answer as a parent that you're asking, the K-12 part of E2D, what does it do? Inside E2D, you have two main streams. One is um, our after-school learning center, Mathnasiums, which operates like a private math school. Uh, and we have access to about a thousand location uh, for any Mathnasium. And we are both online and offline, physically located in your neighborhoods uh, on the thousand locations in 13 countries. What we found is um, uh, schools, because their focus is on cookie cutter, delivering, whatever is needed for the kid, um, uh, they would always try to deliver 
bucketed, I need to just get through this curriculum, whether you get it or not. So what Mathnasium does a wonderful job on that, um, our, uh, one of our education venture, is it really customizes um, individualized learning plan for each of the, um, the students, K-12 students who enro enroll in our program. Uh, it's designed for any level, but our primary focus is K-12, of course, and a university student can come and do calculus as well, but our focus is K-12. And what it does is um, it works um, um, to customize individualized learning plan and tailor uh, the weaknesses, the strengths, and the future needs, all of those things into the same stream of delivery in, in the academic curriculum. So that's our key differentiator. We, um, um, we have used uh, the world's most scientific methods to figure out how to differentiate individualized curriculum for each, each student. Uh, so whenever we design a program, whether it's a math program or a language learning or reading program, uh, all are designed in the mind that, uh, with the mind that students are both in group and students are individuals as well. And mm -hmm. students learn from the group. They learn from one-on-one -on -one instruction. They also learn from peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction, peer-to-peer -peer learning. All three of those components do exist within our program. And to go one step further from that, we also um, have pretty heavy involvement with the parents as well. So parents form a cooperative where they can quality control their kids' education. And they're given frequent access to what it is that's coming up. Um, uh, they're almost taken in the same journey with the kids, what the child is experiencing um, it, with little lower frequency or the right most frequency the parent prefers to be involved in. So what ends up happening is we, instead of we teaching anything to anybody, we end up um, uh, facilitating lifelong learning experiences in every subject, um, uh, which brings us to Math Academy, Language Academy, um, um, and Global Cultural Immersion Academy. So we do have uh, uh, private schools, which actually operates as part of E2D Ventures, uh, which are teaching uh, Bengali, Arabic, um, um, or any ethnic minority uh, languages uh, as part of online immersion pri private schools because we'd like to really make sure that uh, we maintain one to six uh, teacher to student ratio and the right price level so that private school is not a privilege um, for only rich people. We, education equity has been the heart, core of every program design we have. So in America, uh, any person who's like to send their kids to a Catholic school or any other top class private schools your average tuition is $9,000 to $12,000. And in high end, it could be $21,000, which is the case in Bangladesh as well, uh, or the country that I'm from. And, and in, in Brazil, where my uh, daughter is from. And so many Asian countries are similar cases where they have this luxury uh, community of education, which is American standard, but not accessible by general population. So what we're trying to design is global immersion schools with languages, STEM, um, um, to bring at least the part-time private to accessible to everybody, just like edX is trying to do it with higher education and you people, we're trying to do it with K-12 for the rest of the world. And in this process, what's happening is we're creating jobs for um, youth members who are our um, um, uh, faculties uh, we are creating jobs for professionals who want to expand global competency and global, become global professionals. And we're also helping global education entrepreneurs to spread this process. Um, so that's kind of twofold to our organization. One is providing the core education as K-12, um, um, which serves the primary purpose of um, providing low cost, world-class private education um, uh, and the secondary purpose of creating youth employment, and the tertiary purpose to bring education equity to the part of the world, otherwise they wouldn't have it. For an example, um, I grew up in Bangladesh, and I have seen so many gifted students in Bangladesh who are shackled by their certificates and their, um, um, uh, their uh, grade level. But you come to the United States, 
any student who is going to a public school, if they're gifted and if they're surpassing their ability, teachers uh, are required to provide them a seventh grader and ninth grade level math. They can move between classes on their competency level so that they don't get bored. That doesn't exist most of the in the, most of the world. And yeah. through this process, in developing world, I can bring that in. So if a 10th grader is capable of doing Harvard level um, edX, we'll help them go through that process and we'll, we'll mentor and guide them through that process so that by the time they get to Harvard, uh, they're actually one year ahead, just like the American peer groups, not behind because of their country and state of origin or state of economics. <laughs> Fascinating. With all the, what that provides, <laughs> just to even just to even hear about the differences, you know, not something we think about every day. So but it's good to have you explain it. Thank you. Um, so, um, what question? What else you might have as questions? Um, uh, specifically, what's the student experience at E two D? Cool. Uh, so. Um, I, I guess once again, I have to I have to separate. There's two part to the A to D. One is the adult student members who are becoming emerging professionals. The other is uh, K twelve students um, uh, who are um, um, guided by their parents and their teachers. So I guess I I, I kind of mostly covered the. K-12 students, uh, when a K-12 student comes to Mathnasium Learning Center or E2D uh, World School Program, uh, what they would do is would uh, assess them in multiple different levels in the first month, which might take uh, four to eight meetings of half an hour or one hour of four meetings. Um, uh, within the first four hours of service, we try to figure out what level this child is in whatever delivery that we are doing. If it is language or reading, we figure out what level of reading that they're doing. If it is uh, math, Mathnasium has a wonderful program where they can actually learn what grade level they're in, what are the strengths they're struggling with. So once we have that identified, we start the program. Um, and that has all different aspect of it. Uh, with it we, we, we offered the program as if this is actually a gym so uh, they will come in, they would do some warm up, and then they'll dive into things that they don't know. And then they'll close with a fun game, game time. Um, uh, so they, they cool down and plan out the next, next one. That's kind of a typical K-12 student route. But if I translate that to um, a senior member, which could be an adult, um, um, uh, second year college student, first year college student, or a um, high schooler who's in advanced standing, who's trying to get into college, um, or uh, it could be an entrepreneur like you who's just trying to experience A2D. What we try to do is we request them to come and uh, sit into some of our, um, uh, we, we call this education sermon <laughs> every Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Time. Our global A2D cohort comes together to share their learning experience, lifelong learning experience from last week. What new professional skill they have learned, what new things they can co-teach to their peers. We mm -hmm. create lots of cohorts and breakout rooms of these teams and capture those moments. And we learn from each other, global community of learning. And then we are, mentorship is going on during that time. Um, sometimes a, a Eng English expert would come. Sometimes someone like you who's a debating expert would come. Uh, sometimes a science expert would come. Uh, we try to bring in um, uh, all these powerful guests who can actually enrich the learning experience from for our uh, community. Half of it is focused on the guest for the 30 minutes. The other half is focused on individual reflection and sharing the knowledge across the community. One interesting th the thing that we do during those cohorts is like we try to pair them up in um, um, breakout rooms. When they're paired, paired, they're forced to talk to each other. So they build this global connection during that paired to one and one conversation. And then they bring back those knowledge through a scaffolding process. So we build a story together. By the time we close, what was the story today? What happened? If somebody woke up in the morning, had a different kind of tea, how that tea was connected to experiencing meditation or anything that's, that's interconnect all those conversations. We try to build a story out of it and then it close the session. 
Um, and then we, of course, talk about how to be more successful at A2D. So after four sessions, um, um, they would go through um, some um, um, communication training, and then they would go through uh, some business practical trainings, which are um, which could be pro agile project management, um, uh, uh, philosophical thinking, how to think like a design thinker, or systems thinking, or um, um, anything that require maybe social media, um, digital presence, anything that's um, whatever, whatever you can teach, communication to uh, actual technical skills of building a website, maintaining a website, developing automations, marketing communication. All of those are part of a living and breathing organizations. And we try to make sure that people has um, um, a variety of development experiences through leadership process. In the core, we're trying to create this emerging leaders who would share their education through education um, uh, entrepreneurship, which is a, which are, we are trying to convert them to education leaders in the world who can champion their mind of lifelong learning and share this with their community. Great. I think I've covered all my topics. <laughs> we looked at the parents, we looked at the educators, you talked about the adult education, the teachers, what all that looks like. So I think there's a... Something I wanted to say is um, uh, we take the concept of design thinking and system thinking very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, are you familiar with both of the concept? Um, um, or you want me to expand on those concepts? Yeah, please do. So um, uh, design thinking is a philosophy originally developed in West Coast, um, UC Berkeley um, um, and Stanford. The, or, the original idea of design thinking was um, uh, it's the interconnectivity between human and systems. Mm -hmm. um, any complex project, which are very wicked in nature, which we do not know the solution to can be solved using design thinking. And it has so many offspring today, um, like agile product management and so many different kind of offspring has came out since it was originally conceived as the interdisciplinary problem solving technique and innovation technique in early, um, about 50 to 70 years back. Um, that always gives us ground, keeps us grounded. Like every two hours of our learning, we should be able to deliver something um, for any organization or for, for any, for ourselves, for our community, for our peers. So that's a very core to our work model. So everybody who's part of it today or trying to become part of it today, we ask them like, you need to be at least two hours a week committed to your lifelong learning journey, then you can be part of it today. So that's very ingrained in our process. Everybody yeah. who shows up that Saturday do has to spend at least another hour doing something or showing up into another meeting where they're reporting back of what they have done at least for 15 minutes or half an hour. This is what I have delivered for this week. Uh, so that's design thinking. And then um, your uh, system thinking, um, according to the scholars is how the whole universe is interconnected and how we correlate. So everything that we do is to make difference in people's lives um, uh, through education and education entrepreneurship is the idea of systems thinking. So everybody who's contributing for E2D's growth, like I started this thing 20 years back, two hours a week for my passionate job. It has yeah. become a reality today. And every week, uh, my two hours that I've spent because of all this iteration of things that I've done, I see, uh, in my two hours, I see others are spending 200 hours in my community to grow it today. That's pretty, pretty profound. I, I, I share my two hours and I'm getting 200 hours of service and where everybody has an ownership stake on it. Uh, we, we do not build anything unless somebody's champion, championing something and we become co-sponsor of that process. And um, we help them shape it and we help them come up with that model of what is my two hour unit looks like if I want to be a social media manager? Uh, okay. what, <laughs> what is that two hour looks like if I want to watch my first business? Uh, do I need to do this website? Do I need to automate my emails? Do I need to maintain this and that? So all of these are, if you go to Fiverr, they're decluttered. They're very cluttered. I'm sorry, they're not decluttered. They're very cluttered. People would come and just buy something and just walk away. And if, if I go and buy, find somebody in Fiverr, I talk to them, hey, if your service works out for us, uh, if you become part of E2D members, 
um, uh, we can be a better Fiverr to you because you might not get a gig in Fiverr in six months and you might just eventually quit that gig economy. But if you're at E2D, we'll not only help you to maintain a continuous gig, we'll, we'll co-grow it together so that you have a continuous stream of these things growing for you. And you can be independent. You don't have to worry about uh, ever uh, uh, hanging a thing on your uh, shoulder that somebody is going to destroy my job and things like that. Yeah. Lifelong learning. Yeah. In charge Any of your context. <laughs> Super Thank powerful. You. Thank you. Yeah. Those are, I think you've given us a pretty good picture, a broad picture of E2D and the value of it. And I think it's great to hear your story about it. Thank you, Shelby. Thanks for organizing this, or I guess we co-organized this. And thanks for sharing your stories, uh, Shelby. I, uh, next time, it's all about you. Um, thanks for letting E2D to be the guinea pig this time. And hopefully we yeah. can highlight you in our next session. Yeah, I'll take it. We should do, I think it's good to be consistent with this. Exactly. So this is this is our podcast, our video cast. <laughs> right. right. And what should we call it? Um, uh, where learners learn? <laughs> I think you call it lifelong learners. Okay, let's call it and um, lifelong learners LLs. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the LL discussion series from E2D World School. Yep. I think that's I, you can that that'd be a good project for your for your students to put the podcast together. Okay. So cool. Looking forward to um, Looking forward to our fellow faculties. I don't even call them students. I call everybody a faculty over here because instead of teaching something, we call it uh, our philosophy is we facilitate the lifelong learning so that we learn from our learners and we become a part of their solution. Uh, lifelong learning wins. It does. Facilita learning facilitators, not teachers. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Shelby. And uh, looking yeah. forward to our next discussion. Maybe we'll have another guest next time. Sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for this. This was nice. Thank you. This was awesome. <laughs> great. I'm trying to stop my YouTube.